Good morning. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Nanette Christofferson, and along with Pastor Steve Talmadge, we'd like to welcome you to our 1030 in-person and online worship service. I'd like to welcome Pastor Steve back. It's been a couple weeks. He's um, had a bout with COVID, and so he's wearing the mask, making sure everything stays safe for a few more days. So um, welcome him back. Thank you so much. I, I always say no one's more happy than I am to see Pastor Steve back. So it's nice to have you back. Just a few announcements this morning before we get started. Last night at the Fall Festival, we believe we had uh, around 300 people here. We went through 260 hot dogs, and um, it was just a delightful time, and it was nice to see so many people out there with Trunk or Treat. Uh, many of our preschool families were out there and other people of the neighborhood. So thank you so much to all of you who participated and to help make yesterday such a special day. Our food banks are running low, and you can bring in food, boxed items, canned items, and drop them off at the uh, Narthex here or at the Narthex in the COC. You can bring them by to the office during the week. And we will also be asking for gift cards. Uh, the food banks don't have room to keep turkeys frozen, so what they have done in the past few years is to ask people to donate a $10 or $15 or $20 gift card, doesn't matter what grocery store, so that a family might be able to pick up a turkey of their size. So if you'd like to do that, please mark how much money you put on the gift card and place it in the offering plate. And you can bring it by the office too during the week and we'll be able to take care of that for all of you. Christmas, we will be collecting gift cards for Christmas too. And these are gift cards that will be to Target and our youth then will take these gift cards and shop for uh, some of the families of Sauk Elementary School who are going through a difficult time. Some of that money too will also go to a former preschool family that recently lost their father. So we will start that collection um, up in about a week or two, but just know that that is coming too and we'll be asking for gift cards to Target. If you're interested in the cantata and in singing in the cantata, please come to Thursday evening's practice at six o'clock here in the sanctuary. And now we have an event coming up next week called Feed My Starving Children, and we're going to watch a little video about Feed My Starving Children. Have you ever wondered how the meals you pack get to the mouths and the tummies of hungry children? The journey each FMSC meal takes to reach a child in need requires many hands, including your hands, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We believe God inspires volunteers and donors just like you to give your precious time and resources in order to fund and produce the meals, and then allows our partners to safely and intentionally deliver the meals to those who need them most, often in dangerous and hard-to-reach places of the world. We believe in the power of prayer and know that God protects this food so we can reach the hungry in His name. Once the FMSC meals are packed, boxed, and placed on pallets by your hands and you gather to pray over the meals, they are carefully loaded on a shipping container. FMSC staff members pray over each shipment again before it leaves our warehouse. The meals then travel by truck, train, and ship to their destination country where they're met by our partner ministry and cleared through customs. The meals then take another ride, often by a local trucking company, to get to the partner's warehouse or ministry site, where they are unloaded and await distribution. The meals may either be hand-delivered by our partner or picked up by other smaller ministries, churches or groups in need, and delivered by truck, car, bike, mule, small boats, and often even by foot to schools, orphanages, hospitals, and homes to reach the hungry. On average, the trip from FMSC to our mission partner site takes anywhere from two weeks to two months, depending on where in the world it is going and how difficult it is to get there. No matter where these meals go, the reaction when they arrive is the same. Joyful, grateful smiles can be seen and cheers of joy can be heard as precious kids you've enabled us to reach know they will have something good to eat today. You make happy kids with full tummies happen. You make this process succeed. Thank you for taking part in this incredible FMSC journey.
Let us prepare our hearts and minds now as we get ready to enter into worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Please turn to your pamphlets now, the feast and celebration, as we begin with a brief order of confession and forgiveness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us confess our sin to God, who is faithful and just, and who has promised to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, have mercy on us. We confess to you that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not trusted you with our whole heart. We have not loved one another in deed and in truth. In your compassion, forgive our sin, and so uphold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our light and our truth. Amen. With joy, I proclaim to you that Almighty God, rich in mercy, abundant in love, forgives you all your sin and grants you newness of life in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Please stand for our opening hymn, number 505, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never seated. 
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel. And bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our worship continues with the reading of God's word. Good morning on this 21st Sunday after Pentecost. Our first reading comes from Jeremiah chapter 31. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them up out of the land of Egypt. A covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, 
for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. Our second reading comes from Romans chapter 3. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For no human being will be justified in his sight by deeds prescribed by the law. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction since all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood, effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of boasting? It is excluded. By what law? By that of works? No, but by that of the law of faith. For we hold that a person is justified by faith apart from the works prescribed by the law. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the gospel. Gospel according to Luke. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. The Gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Today is Reformation Sunday, but at Love of Christ, it also marks Confirmation Sunday. At our nine o'clock service, we had the joy of five new students uh, confirming their faith, affirming their baptism. I'd like to ask you, do you remember what your Confirmation Sunday was like? Do you remember your Confirmation verse? Do you remember Confirmation classes? Any hands up? Perhaps you had to go in front of the church and proclaim your faith. Perhaps you had to just read your verse. Or maybe you just needed to come forward and profess your faith through the Apostles' Creed. I'm just curious, how many of you were confirmed Lutheran? Raise your hand. Keep your hands up. How many of you were confirmed in another denomination? And how many of you were baptized as an adult? All right. It is wonderful to see, praise the Lord, how God has continued to move through you, through your confirmation classes, through the Holy Spirit, through your baptism, and has brought you here today to continue on in your faith. In some ways, you've learned that faith is a journey. 
It's not a one-stop shop. In fact, we like to let our confirmation students know that. <laughs> when you're done with confirmation, you're just beginning. I'd also like to let you know a little bit more about our confirmation ministry. It begins in seventh grade and it lasts for three years. In seventh grade, children explore the Old Testament. In eighth grade, they explore the New Testament. And Bev Jersvig has been our faithful confirmation teacher, um, teaching these kids for the past couple years of the Old and New Testament. Then when they are freshmen, it's the pastor's turn. And we uh, talk about Christianity through the lens of being a Lutheran. And so we bring forth a small catechism where we talk about the Creed, the Ten Commandments, and the Lord's Prayer. We talk about law and gospel. We talk about the Reformation and Martin Luther and other reformers. We talk about our two sacraments of holy baptism and holy communion. We also talk about things like adiaphora, which are things that are not that big of a deal within the church, but sometimes can be made to be so. And after this Luther year that they have, they then are asked to do a project. And that project this year was asking the students to ask someone who is a, per a person of faith, a person of the Christian faith, and to ask them the following questions. Tell me about a time that was the best day of your life. Tell me about a day that was the worst day of your life. Tell me about a time when you felt God was near. Tell me about a time when you felt God was far away. And the last question was, what would you tell your 10th grade self now that you're beyond the 10th grade? This year, our confirmands, all of them ended up interviewing a grandparent. And as they interviewed their grandparents, many of them said that they felt they knew their grandparents pretty well. But they also, each of them, learned something new about their grandparent and about the faith of their grandparent. They heard stories of how God had intervened in their lives. They heard stories about times they felt God was far away, times they had doubts. And they also heard stories of intervention, of God and how God played a part in their lives where they experienced profound joy. And as these young kids heard these stories, these testaments from their grandparents, they begin to see their grandparents in a totally different way. They begin to see that a life of faith doesn't mean that it's going to be a perfect life or that only good things will happen because you're a believer. They saw that in a life of faith is full of curves, is full of up and downs. But the one thing that is steadfast is God, is Jesus. And as I thought about how these confirmands saw their grandparents in a whole new way, I thought about our Christian faith and the Lutheran lens in which we see Jesus. The Talmud is a bunch of writings and commentaries from ancient rabbis. And in it, the rabbis, one of the rabbis states this, we do not see things how they are. We see things how we are. We do not see things how they are. We see things how we are. And maybe another way of saying this is we do not see things that we don't expect to see. We can look at a picture and it looks like grass and sod and we don't notice the little owl in it because we don't expect to see an owl buried down in the grass and sod. But then when you learn that an owl can also bury and have a home on the, prairie, on the prairie lands rather than up in a tree, you suddenly change your expectation and you can now see that owl in the grass and sod. Our faith is about a way of seeing, a way of seeing through God, a way of Jesus kind of tapping us on the shoulder, showing us showing us a new way to look at the world, a new way to see humanity, the way in which God sees it. Would you please pray with me? 
Creator Lord, prepare our hearts as we get ready to enter into your word. Might we catch a glimpse, Lord, of how you need us to see, to see humanity, to see our world. Father, Spirit, Jesus, may you enter into the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts, and may it be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Well, we're there. Maybe you didn't think we would get there, but we have been on this journey with Jesus to Jerusalem, and this is the last stop of Jesus' journey before he gets to Jerusalem. This started back in Luke chapter 9, 51, after the transfiguration, and the disciples and Jesus began turning their face towards Jerusalem. And in this time, Jesus has made some very pointed teachings. And as we look back to the gospel of what we've been working through, and we call this the journey to Jerusalem, it is also called Luke's travel narrative. And part of this travel narrative, there's like a little subline within it. And that starts in chapter 15. And beginning from chapter 15 to where we are today, this has been known as the gospel of the outcasts. And if you think about where we've been in the past couple months, Jesus has oftentimes stopped and pointed his finger, showing us who we should be seeing, oftentimes overlooked by the crowds, overlooked by people. This section of Luke's gospel has also been called the heart of Luke's gospel. In fact, the heart of the gospel. So it starts in chapter 15 with the lost coin and the, and the parable of the lost sheep. We then moved on to the dishonest manager. We moved on to uh, the rich man and Lazarus. We talked about um, the lepers. And in the past few weeks, we talked about the unjust judge and the widow. And last week, we talked about the Pharisee and the tax collector. All of these vignettes, all of these stories, all of these narratives have been pointing to those who we often label as on the fringes of society. As we look to what we have before us today, we see Zacchaeus is interested in Jesus. So Jesus and his disciples are coming through Jericho. Luke, the gospel writer, gives us a couple indications of who Zacchaeus is. A couple of descriptive words, he tells us that Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector and also rich. Well, one might assume of a chief tax collector, one, he is Jewish, he does belong to the Jewish community, but that he would be despised by the Jewish community and seen as a traitor because he is working for the Roman government. And he's the one that might take a little bit more taxes from them than he should for the chief tax collectors did not have a great reputation. And so they looked at them as people who were untrustworthy. And the fact that Zacchaeus was rich kind of showed them that maybe he's taking from the top. Maybe he's stealing from it. The gospel writer also informs us that, that Zacchaeus is short in stature. In the culture of the first world, when someone was short, they considered that a uh, deficient in character. They considered that someone um, who is short might be short in spirit and short in character, meaning they might be a little greedy, a little snide. Maybe you can't quite trust them. And all of this was attached, unfortunately, to someone just because they might be short. So as we look at these considerations of the first century world and, what they, and how they would have looked at Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus might have been nudged a lot, might have been pushed a lot in that crowd because people would have thought, he doesn't deserve to see Jesus. And why would Jesus want to see him? So as Zacchaeus is in the crowd, he realizes the path that they'll be going. So he humiliates himself by picking up his robes and running running down the path ahead of the crowd and climbing up a tree. Now this is something that would have been a humility, humiliating act for him because he was short, because he couldn't see. And as he's up in the tree, the crowd comes by 
and Jesus comes by. I wonder how many in the crowd that day even noticed that there was a man in the tree. Were they even looking around? And as Jesus comes by, he notices, he notices who is in the tree. And he tells Zacchaeus to come down. Now, I won't sing the Zacchaeus song for you, okay? Even though it follows scripture quite well, but it might stick with you all day long. And uh, that might, or, or, or for the next couple weeks even. So Jesus sees Zacchaeus and he brings him down and he tells Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And Zacchaeus is like overwhelmed, shocked, surprised that Jesus even saw him. And then in verse 8, we see an interesting thing happen where the, Jesus and Zacchaeus have this conversation. And as they have this conversation, it's almost like Zacchaeus is being transformed within that conversation. For he says to Jesus, I will give half of what I make to the poor, and I will give back fourfold if I have done anyone wrong. And Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and says, for salvation has come to your home this day. You are a son of Abraham, and I have come to save the lost. Now, in that translation, looking at it through those eyes, that transformation of Zacchaeus happens right away, and it's almost this um, dialogue between Jesus and Zacchaeus. There's another way that this has been translated. And this is found in the English Standard Version, in the New International Version, in the Message, and in the New King James Version as well. And the verb is changed. The verb is uh, future tense in verse eight, in the NRSV that we heard today. But in these other versions, the translation is present tense. And that kind of changes things. And maybe it changes who Zacchaeus and Jesus are addressing. For in this version, Zacchaeus comes down from the tree. Jesus tells him he's coming to his house. And Zacchaeus says, Lord, I give half of my money to the poor. And if I um, do something wrong to someone, I pay them back fourfold. As Jesus hears this, he says, Salvation has come to your house today since you are a son of Abraham, and I have come to save the lost, to seek and to save the lost. In this way of hearing, it might be addressed to the crowd, and the crowd hears this from Zacchaeus and Jesus. For the crowd, at the time Jesus goes to Zacchaeus, they begin to mumble and they begin to grumble because here's this Jesus going to have dinner with a sinner, with a chief tax collector. They have their eyes set that this person is always wrong, is despised because of the practices he has. Perhaps the crowd now is awakened, awakened to a person who has been giving half of his income, who has been paying someone back fourfold should he do something wrong. Perhaps that day the eyes of the crowd were opened, were opened to be able to see Zacchaeus in the way that Jesus saw Zacchaeus. Either translation brings us to sight, brings us to seeing a person in a new way, to seeing a person in a new light, how Jesus sees that person. As we look to our faith, Jesus, like I said earlier, is always nudging us, nudging us to see the other, how God sees us, how God sees our heart. If we look to the Reformation today, and we look back, we see that Martin Luther saw something, something that was missing in the church. In fact, he saw 95 theses, 95 things that were missing in the church, 95 ways of the church needing to reform. 
He didn't imagine that he was going to set off a whole new movement that would have all kinds of consequences. But one of the things in the theses, he wanted to make sure that people knew that they no longer needed an intermediary between them and God, that they could go directly to God, that they could experience God's grace without having to pay a penance, that God's grace was free, that God's love is unconditional, and that God sees them and seeks a relationship with them and with us. If we only look back to the Reformation and go, yeah, that was a certain time and place, then we miss something. We miss something about what Martin Luther and what God and what Jesus showed us. That God is always on the move, always reforming us, always moving us towards his way of seeing. The problem is, is we can be blinded by our own sight. But as we remember the Reformation of 500 years ago, we need to know and trust that God is still reforming this world, our church, ourselves, our community. And might we ask and trust that God brings to us his sight so that we might catch a glimpse of God's purpose and plan as we proclaim God's love to others. Amen.
to stand as we join in confessing our faith as it's recorded in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he'll come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray. Pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Reforming God, we give you thanks for Martin Luther and all who have courageously heard your call and boldly risked speaking your truth to power seeking to refocus the center of the mission of the church to your good news of unconditional love and forgiveness offered freely through Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Justifying God. Too often we have come to misunderstand the good news. We think it is our efforts, our abilities, our good deeds that justify us before you. Help us to put our ultimate trust in the good news that it is your effort, your action, your love through Jesus' death and resurrection that justifies all humanity before you. All we can say is thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Calming God, we are a people and a nation on edge. We are bombarded by daily messages of division, tension, and disagreement. We are anxious for the upcoming election. We worry and are concerned about who might best work for the common good and help all of us to be the blessing you call us to be. Calm our hearts, minds, and spirits. Lord, in your mercy. Restoring God, we pray for your spirit to move across this globe to inspire leaders and laborers, scientists and farmers, producers and consumers on how we can best steward and care for this earth, respond to disasters, and continue to affirm the beauty and abundance of your creation. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Healing God, we give you thanks for news of no more cancer for Stephen and Alec. We pray for your comfort, healing, and strength for John, Barb, Bev, Cora, Ollie, Sally, Gary, Corey, and Jerry. We lift in silence those especially on our hearts this morning. Lord, in your mercy. Faith forming God. Bless all who were confirmed this morning. Mason Keith, Kenny Alamito, Hunter Rothstein, Samantha Hebert, and Aaron Obert. Lord, might they know that this is just the beginning of something new. Open their hearts to your Holy Spirit. Teach them your word. And give them courage to proclaim their faith. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.
It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. On the night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples saying, this cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. chains of hatred and fear. Have mercy on us, mercy on us, mercy on us. Lamb of God, you are the way of justice and peace. Have mercy on us, mercy on us, mercy on us. Lamb of God, you are the way of mercy and love. Have mercy on us, mercy on us, mercy on us. Lamb of God, Take 
duty to deliver. Let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Be we would be always blessing. Let us be, let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory into glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast Let us pray. We give you thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the healing power of this gift of life. In your mercy, strengthen us through this gift, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand for the benediction. And now, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please join us in our sending hymn, What a Fellowship, What a Joy Divine.
to serve and love the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank you. 